Hi, my name is Barry Anderson. I'm here today for Pro Video Coalition. We're doing a webinar here, first one to kick off the year. And this one's a fun one. This one's talking about working and shooting in extreme locations. So today we're gonna to be jumping back and forth. I got a couple uh, examples, videos, and uh, some stills to show you from some of the crazy places I've been that have ranged from the uh, windy Iceland to Chernobyl to flooding a basement with 40,000 gallons of water over and over again. Um, I'm gonna show you those, but then we're also gonna talk through exactly what are some of the tips that I've learned from that and really how often those come up in regular shooting. So we're kind of going to jump back and forth between those. What I want you to do today is make sure to be jumping into the chat room and asking questions. I'm here uh, live online and going ahead and answering those. So if there's something that you want in more detail, just go ahead and throughout the webinar, just go ahead and ask those questions. So let's go ahead and jump right in. If you aren't familiar with me, my name is Barry Anderson. I'm a director cinematographer and I've been working in this business now for 20 years. And this is my second year working with the Pro Video Coalition Movie Ola in film tools. I'm the author of the DSLR Filmmaker's Handbook. This is working in extreme locations. So let's start with just the cold. I'm from Minnesota, and Minnesota is known for being cold. No, we don't just live in igloos. I've shot in the north of Sweden in the Ice Hotel. I've been in mountaintop shooting music videos, so I've kind of been everywhere. But what I like to tell people is I've actually been shooting in Minnesota when it's been colder in Minnesota than it has been on Mars. So I'm definitely someone who's experienced cold in the past. So I've dealt a lot with heat and radiation. I've shot in central Texas. I've shot in Chernobyl um, in the middle of summer. I've actually shot throughout the Mideast as well. So I'm familiar with not only hot, I'm familiar with muggy, and I'm also familiar with dusty. All these things can conspire against you to cause problems. Another thing is I've dealt with water and mosquitoes, AKA bugs. So when we shot this feature film where we flooded a basement with 40,000 gallons of water over and over again, that's just one element. I've shot in the rain. I've shot, you know, when it's been, you know, foggy, misty. So I've been working in all these environments where water can really pollute your camera, either knowingly or unknowingly. And oftentimes when you are dealing with a damp, moist area, you are actually dealing with critters, bugs, and other things that go. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. The other thing that I've dealt a lot with is actually wind. Um, I have some crazy stories about wind and there's some things that you need to know to be able to protect yourself and be able to actually get the shot. So I have some cool examples for me from when I was shooting in Iceland when we had these crazy wind storms. It actually happened to be when Christopher Nolan was shooting Interstellar and his crew was affected with it as well. So let's go ahead and jump right into the cold. Um, if we're dealing with cold, these are the things that I really want you to pay attention to. A lot of people just kind of go out and if you're used to working, you know, inside or in kind of traditional areas, a lot of times people say, let's go ahead and hand hold the camera. And this is something I want to kind of dissuade you of. If you're shooting in extreme cold locations, I want you to support the camera. The reason I want you to support the camera is, is one of the places that is first to kind of go numb are your fingertips. And it's really, really hard when you're holding heavy objects, metal objects, even if you have good um, uh, gloves and whatnot on, you're losing that blood flow to your tips, so it's actually really problematic. So I want you to go ahead and support the camera so that you can keep your hands warm, keep them non-stressed, so that you're able to work, hit buttons, go through menus, change out cards when it comes to it, but try not to set up a shoot where you're gonna be go ahead and hand holding the camera in the extreme cold. So one of the great things is to support the camera is a tripod, but this is where a lot of people, because we are you know, not made of money, a lot of people buy aluminum or the cheaper uh, tripod. And what I want to encourage you to do is if you're gonna be doing some of these extreme shoots, especially in cold weather, is invest in a carbon fiber tripod. They are much less cold to the touch. So again, whether you have to touch them with your hands without gloves or you have gloves on, there's much less conductivity so that your hands won't be drained of their heat and it'll help keep your fingers feeling much better and keep you working much more efficient. Another thing is I want you to wrap your gear. So this sounds a little bit strange. Keeping your gear warm, keeping it away from moisture, keeping it away from the wind, but actually one of the biggest things that can go wrong in cold weather are your cables because they become very brittle. So actually they actually sell two different types of wraps. They have both a silicone and a Teflon wrap that's almost like a tape and you can tape up your cables. By doing this, I believe silicone uh, protects you to about 50 degrees below zero. Teflon protects you for below 50 degrees. So this gives you extra insulation on some of the most delicate parts. And let me tell you, if you're climbing up a mountain or in a very remote region, if you only bring one set of cables and you don't protect them, there's a good chance that you're gonna have a short or a break and you're gonna be basically down and not shooting. So that's definitely something I want you to take a look at. Another thing is I want you to actually know your camera and your rig. Now, this might sound like, well, duh, but the thing is a lot of us are jumping from camera to camera on jobs. Sometimes we get hired and we're using other people's equipment. And it's one of those things that you can't find yourself in an extreme remote location where you're freezing and you're trying to keep yourself warm, you're trying to keep your battery life extended and then be learning on the job. So if you know you're going into this extreme environment, in this case, you know, in a very cold environment, make sure you know all the menu structures, make sure you know all where all the buttons are, all the ins and outs of your camera, your 
system, your rig, your monitors, your batteries, everything you have to know literally as if it's a second nature because when you take off your glove and let's say it's 20 below, you don't wanna be fiddling around like trying to figure out where to go. You wanna be able to go right there and get your glove back in a warm or your hand back in a warm environment. So the other thing is, is doing your pre-production. I know a lot of jobs now don't have time for us to do pre-production, but this is something where I want as much of my camera pre-built, as much of the rigs pre-built. Because again, whether it's before I actually go out on location or if I'm in a cabin or a tent or something like that, I'm gonna go out. I wanna pre-build as much as possible so that I'm not actually doing that leg work when the weather is most extreme and most unforgiving. If I can have the slider built and I can carry it out, it's better than putting together all the little screws and pieces where it's very difficult to do with gloves and you're gonna be exposing your hand and your skin to the elements. One of the great tips I have is I order a lot of stuff from you know, you know, Film Tools, b &H, Adorama, all these different places, and a lot of them come with these little silica uh, gel packs. And for years, I just threw them away. I didn't know what to do with them. But now I actually have a whole bag that I keep. And the reason I do this is anytime I'm, you know, either checking my lenses on a plane or I'm bringing them out in the elements, I will always have a silica gel pack next to each one of my lenses. The other thing is if I'm doing a time lapse saying from day to night, or I'm doing night time lapses where the uh, temperature can change a lot, I will sometimes tape them around the outside of my lens to help keep the moisture from building up. So I find that these little things that you know become free as you start to collect them over time are something that I always want to have with me because again, moisture isn't good. And even in the cold when it's drier, what happens is when we have the temperature changes, that's when you get moisture buildup on your equipment and these silica gel packs will definitely help. The other thing is you need to keep your batteries warm. Cold and batteries definitely do not mix. And a lot of times what people do is they just run out and they start shooting and they don't realize how much time they're losing. So you need to be able to calculate how many batteries you need to take with you. And one of the things that's actually really weird is it can actually matter what type of battery. So a lot of times I'm using Anton Bauer batteries and I have a Dionic 90. That tends to die much faster um, out in the cold than does my Hydron uh, 120. That battery, the way that it's actually constructed inside is better for it. So there are different batteries that work better in cold, but it's one of those things you wanna make sure that if you're used to shooting with one or two batteries all day, but you're going to extreme location, you're going to need to have more batteries because that battery life is gonna be zapped. So this is another reason you wanna protect your gear and try to keep that as warm as possible, both in the storage, both in the transport, and then if you can, while you're actually shooting your footage. So one of the oddest things that I can say is what I found is really helpful is a lot of times if I'm gonna be you know, trekking out to a remote location, I don't wanna carry as much as possible, or if I do have to carry things, I definitely don't want it to be heavy. So I actually found one of the best ways to keep some of my batteries warm is actually bringing an empty cooler. It isolates, you know, insulates the batteries from the outside cold and actually inside it stays warm. So you're actually using it kind of in the reverse of what most people do, but it's very light. You can slide it on snow, slide it on ice. They're fairly durable, but that's one way if you have the manpower and and or the vehicles of transport, a cooler can be a great spot to store your batteries while you're out in the field. The other thing is you need to heat things up. So this can be in the matter of whether or not it's your hands, you have little hand warmers you can buy and keep them warm. And there's actually clothes now that are lined that you can add a battery to and it actually, it's almost like electric blanket wear, depending on how uh, remote you're going. The one thing you wanna do is don't get too carried away with keeping your body warm so you start sweating because if you start sweating, then it actually works opposite. So you wanna stay warm without getting so hot that you're sweating, but then you're, uh, the gear and batteries and stuff itself. You wanna keep those warm. So actually a really great tip that I found is if you have a generator or you have access to power, if you go to a place like Lowe's, Home Depot, you can actually buy a heated cable. They're usually used to keep your pipes warm if you have exposed pipes in your basement or crawl space of your house. But basically what it does, it just heats up what looks like an extension cord. And so if you're doing a time-lapse overnight, you can actually tape that to the um, uh, time-lapse rig. You can wrap it near around your camera and it actually keeps that area warm so that you don't have ice buildup, keeps the moisture level from developing no dew condensation. So this is a great thing that, you know, costs maybe 30, 40 bucks and can really save your butt. You know, it seems again, kind of obvious that you wanna keep on warm clothing, but I know a lot of people, if you're not familiar with working in cold, you might think, you know, a jacket or gloves or hat's gonna be good enough, but you really gotta pay attention. Most of the manufacturers will actually give you labels as to what it's rated to uh, be used in the cold. And what you wanna do is, if you're going out for the first time, make sure that you're overdressed, not underdressed. You can always layer and take it off, but I've seen so many people kind of be like, oh, I'm from this area of the country, I got a coach, but then they go to say Alaska or the North Canada, and they realize very quickly that their cold is a whole different meaning of cold. So you wanna make sure that you have warm clothes, bring extra ones, because again, if you're out there for a long period of time, if something gets wet when you're out on location and you don't have the ability to dry it, then you gotta go ahead and make sure you have extra so you can swap out. You wanna keep yourself dry and warm. Uh, that's gonna keep you safe and help you keep and get the footage that you want.
The last thing that I want to talk about is actually safety. I know that a lot of us, when we get jobs, get asked to go to you know cool places and kind of get these great stories. A lot of times people don't think about, you know, am I being safe? I know that early in my career, I actually got hired to go uh, with these people and shoot some ice climbing. Uh, I was not a climber before, they said they would help me. And I found myself in some pretty precarious positions where I wasn't comfortable and either myself and or my gear could have been uh, compromised. And nowadays when people are kind of looking for work and trying to take anything that comes their way, is they wanna make sure that whatever you get hired on, whether or not you're instituting it or you're being hired and someone else is running it, make sure that there are safety things in place. And if it's, by God, if it's something that you don't feel safe with, don't do it, let someone else that's more qualified do it. Because you know, as much as we love doing this, we don't want anyone hurt or injured. Uh, no image is worth that. Another weird thing is if you're not familiar with cold environments is there is a lack of moisture and this can actually lead to a buildup of static electricity. So if you're used to dealing with your computers, changing out hard drives or whatnot, same thing should go when you're dealing with these low moisture areas. You in a low moisture and dry areas is you want to make sure to discharge any static electricity before you're touching your hard drives, before you're touching your media cards, your camera, because by God, if you've gone through all the effort and the suffering to get a great shot, you don't want to lose it by having some sort of static discharge. So it's just something you want to keep in mind as you're working in these extreme environments. The other thing is, is you want to allow your equipment, both the lenses and camera, um, to warm gradually. I know a lot of people, they'll actually kind of come in from the cold and they'll want to be looking at stuff. So they try to kind of accelerate that, what you want to do is let it kind of go over time. The reason is, is any sort of extreme temperature change can add to moisture, not only on the lens, but actually inside of the camera. And it, once you have moisture inside that camera, now you're opening yourself up for shorting, uh, electrical issues. And again, if you're in a remote location, this could mean downtime or even a malfunction that you can't fix. So let things either cool or warm gradually. Don't ever try to accelerate that process. Make sure to get the equipment acclimated to the where you're gonna be shooting. And if you're going in and out of say a warm or cold area, there are times where I actually store my gear maybe outside so it stays cold and only bring in what I need to so that it's staying in that environment for long periods of time. So let's jump over to heat and in some cases radiation because we're gonna be talking a little about uh, Chernobyl. But let's go ahead and talk about what exactly this means. What are we looking at? So in this case, one of my examples is I'm going through Chernobyl. So Chernobyl had this awful nuclear um, disaster that left the town of 40,000 people basically in ruins. So I was able to go there in this exclusion zone under the supervision of the KGB and the government. And we basically got to go in and spend several days shooting throughout this region. In some cases, we actually went to areas that haven't been seen by more than two or three people in the last 30 plus years. So this was a crazy environment that we just didn't know what we were really in for. So it was kind of one of those places where not only are we dealing with radiation, we're dealing with dust, we're dealing with heat. And in this case, it was probably about 90% humidity. So it was just hot. So there wasn't really a thriving environment there to use, so we didn't know what we needed. So let's jump through some of the things that we learned in that that we've used in subsequent shoots. So first and foremost is water. I know a lot of us get so consumed when we're shooting that we're just kind of into the focus and getting it. And what you don't realize is you're sweating and you're hot. A lot of times you actually don't get thirsty and you don't realize how much uh, moisture you're losing. You must have water and you must have it on your body. And even if you're not thirsty, you have to be drinking often because when you get super sweaty and you lose all that, it's very easy to get heat stroke. And if you get heat stroke, especially if you're shooting by yourself, there may not be someone there to help uh, kind of correct the problem and you might actually end up getting in a life or death situation. The other thing is, is not only do you get hot, but the camera gets hot. This is especially true if you're shooting in say a high frame rate um, where you're taxing the sensor is you don't want the camera to overheat. You don't want the batteries to overheat, but sometimes you can't shade the camera. Sometimes it has to be out in the elements. So I always tell people, try to go ahead and shade the camera when you can, put it in the shade, create shading. And one of the most simple tips that I've found is I actually bring a white towel. And if I can't, I don't have the time or don't have an area to do it, I throw the white towel over or a reflective surface over the top and that reflects the sun and the heat so that it keeps the camera, the battery and the electronics at a much cooler rate in between the shots. So it's kind of a little tip that really can help you keep your camera working longer in these extreme environments. The other thing is, it sounds dumb, but you can have something as simple as an umbrella. An umbrella can keep you safe, it can keep your gear safe, and it packs really small. So it's one of those, you know, just buy a cheap one that you can bring around. You know, if some of it gets dinged up or some of it breaks, it's fine. It still will help you go ahead and uh, keep yourself safe. The other thing that I always tell people is don't be too proud. Yes, it's nice to look good. It's nice to kind of feel like you're a cool person, but sometimes when you're in extreme environments, wearing protective gear, or in my case, a silly straw hat can be the difference between heat stroke and not. In this case, I was steady cam operating in the middle of central Texas, and it was about 112 degrees, and I had no kind of, you know, where, no place to get away from the heat. 
And in this case, I didn't have water and didn't have access to water and I almost got heat stroke and luckily someone was able to help me. But I guarantee without my silly straw hat, it would have been a different story. I definitely wouldn't be able to shoot all day and get the shots that I needed to. The other thing I tell people is if you have the budget or you have the means, pack an extra camera. When you're in these extreme, you know, whether it be heat, cold, windy, if you have an, a problem with your camera, sometimes having that second body to let the camera cool down or let the moisture uh, kind of, you know, evaporate, whatever that is, having that second body can be the difference between getting the shot and not. I know it's not always feasible, but it's something I tell people that if you're talking to someone and they're sending you out in these remote locations, you know, the difference of, you know, somewhere between $100 to $700 for a day rental camera, you know, in relation to the overall budget might be the best insurance policy you can have. The other thing we talked about is moisture. Again, you can have moisture when it's the have extreme temperatures in the cold. You can have moisture when it's very hot and humid. And so in this case, you wanna go ahead and take care of your electronics. Electronics and water never mix, never a good idea. So you wanna keep your camera dry. You wanna keep the, you know, the temperature of when you're going in and out. When I was shooting in uh, the Middle East, I would say it was probably about a 60 to 80 degree difference between outside to inside. So if you were constantly bringing your camera in and out, same way you would if you're going from heat to cold, this really wreaks havoc with the electronics and you're giving yourself a much higher likelihood of getting moisture buildup on the electronic parts and you definitely don't want that. That will definitely shorten the length of your uh, equipment. The other thing I tell people is try to change your lens in a safe environment. So if you're outside, it's super muggy, exposing, you know, say the sensor on and off again to that moisture buildup is not great. If you can bring it inside of a car, if you can bring it inside of a building, again, as long as the building is in such an extreme change that you're putting stress on the camera, having a protected area, whether it be a tent, a bag, something like that, will uh, potentially save you from problems down the line. Not only do moisture a problem, but you have in these extreme environments, you always have things like dust and, you know, in this case, radiation if you're in Chernobyl that you wanna keep out of your camera. The other thing is I tell people if you're using an eyepiece, whether it's an EVF or just one you put on the back of your DSLR, if you're going around and you're hiking and you're kind of putting stuff on your back or shoulder, you're not paying attention. If you're not careful, if the sun actually hits the eyepiece, it turns it into basically a giant magnifying glass. You can actually burn the back of the LCD or you can actually fry your EVF. So it's something that you wanna make sure to always have protection on your EVF or your um, eyepiece because you don't want to actually damage your uh, equipment long-term. The other thing is I definitely want filters. The reason I want filters is number one, if I'm going in and out of a building and I'm getting condensation buildup and I have to go ahead and you know do a lot more um, you know wiping with microfiber or other means, doing it on the uh, filter means less touching of the lens, less scratching over time. It lengthens, lengthens the lifespan of my lens, but also it keeps me, you know, if there is moisture buildup, it keeps it off the front of the lens. If there is dust or radiation or anything else, it keeps it off the front of the lens. So it, when I'm working these extreme locations where it's not, you know, an environment that I can control, having something like a really good pure UV protection is something that you wanna look at because again, it's saving the investment in your uh, lenses in this case. The other thing is if you can, if you can have something like a pop-up tent, they're actually pretty cheap now. You can buy them at places like Costco and stuff like that. Having a small portable tent so that if you are in this remote area or if you're you know, kind of out in the fields where there isn't really protection, having an ability to put up a little workstation to keep charging, keep your data management, keeping your equipment out of the direct sun and or you know, being able to kind of control the moisture that's in that area, having something like a pop-up tent really could be a really good investment for you to look at. The other thing is, is you yourself. You know, a lot of times on set, we're instructed to wear black, dark colors that we kind of blend in, but when you're out shooting on your own, if it is extreme heat situation, wearing something like white or neutral colors will definitely keep your body a lot cooler. In this case, it won't, you know, help you not sweat as much, help your hands be drier to work with your equipment, and it'll keep you from heat stroke. You have to consume a lot less water, so it just makes your day more efficient. So go out and buy some khaki pants and a white uh, shirt and get yourself out there and start shooting. The other thing is, is you don't want your hands to get overly sweaty and moist. The reason for this is number one, we're touching all the electronic gear. We don't want that, especially if we're holding our equipment, then everything becomes slippery. So having some sort of a light glove to keep that moisture away from you and your electronics, or in some cases, having some sort of a, a powder that you can put on that dries out your hands, but obviously you don't want that powder to translate to your gear. Finding a way to make sure that you don't have clammy hands is something that you definitely wanna pay attention to, especially in a high moisture, high humidity area. So let's jump over to wind. I've been in places as crazy as Iceland all the way to the USS Harry Truman. So I flew out to an aircraft carrier and not only were we at the high seas, not only was it windy from that, but you had actual fighter jets coming in and landing, jet engines, you know, starting up, them doing tests. And it was a super crazy area for us to work in. So we were dealing with, you know, obviously crazy weather, 
environments, crazy electronic environments, and frankly, crazy uh, noise environments. So all these things teach us lessons over time of what we're supposed to do. And so in this case, you know, if you got a fire jet coming and landing on you, you know, just take a look. Yes, it's awe inspiring, but how do you keep your gear protected? How do you actually get a shot the way that you want to? So let's jump out to a less extreme. So when I was shooting in Iceland, we were going around kind of location scouting and I asked our guide, you know, is it safe? And he said, you know, of course it's safe. I said, but it's like really windy. And he's like, no, no, it's just fine, it's just fine. I'm like, but it's really, really windy. And if you take a look at this clip, you can see, you know, I'm about 200 pound uh, adult male and I can't stand up. You can see my knees are wet, so I'm like falling over and it's not good. So we were able to get the shot. And even with one person on each leg of the tripod and someone kind of laying on top, we were still getting footage that was pretty shaky. Uh, luckily we were able to stabilize it in post. But you know, to, to give you an example of just exactly how windy it is. So if you take a look at this clip here, it's pretty insane. It looks like a normal car, but when you actually go ahead and take a look at it when you walk around, well, I'll just let you listen to it. Might look like a normal car. If you come over here, it's a little different. You can notice that there's gray on the side of the car. This car just got sandblasted. This is completely gone. You notice that the windows are broken and inside the car. It's nothing but glass, ash, and grit. And you thought when I said windy, you're like, well, how bad can that be? It can get pretty bad. So in this case, as you can see the damage that was done, in this case, I wanna start off by my advice is saying, get a filter. Again, a UV filter, a circular polarizer, something to put in front of your glass because at any moment, if wind gets really bad, you can get, you know, whether it be volcanic ash, whether or not it's, you know, sand grains, whatever it is, if that's pelting, it's basically a giant sandblaster and you don't want that in your equipment, you don't want your lens, so get a filter to protect your lens. That's gonna save you a ton of money. The other thing is I want you to have a safe area. You know, I've known people who are storm chasers. I know you can work in these crazy areas, but you want, whether it be a car, whether it be a house, whether it be some sort of natural structure you can tuck behind. Um, I've been shooting at the beach before where we had to go behind a uh, uh, kind of a rock formation to get out of the elements from time to time. So you wanna find ahead of time before you set up and start shooting, where is your safe area? And can you either stage there or how quickly and easily can you get there? And what in an emergency do you need to leave in order to get to a safe area? Because again, I want safety. I want great, beautiful images and I want people to push themselves, but I do want us all to be safe. The other thing is, is you want weight to hold things down, especially again, if you don't have a lot of crew, this is something that can really you know, be a problem that we're dealing with smaller, lighter objects and that coupled with really strong winds is a problem. So one of the things that you can do is you can get the carabiners for rock climbing you can tie ropes on and either tie your equipment down or put like a sandbag on it. One of the things that I absolutely love is the fact that, you know, the tripods, you can hook it on the bottom and you can hang something from it to add that weight. That's super critical. But sometimes when we travel, we don't have the ability to bring like a big sandbag with or whatnot. So one of the things I've actually found is kind of this cool sandbag where it comes with a carabiner and it actually is, you know, empty. So wherever you go, you can fit up to 70 pounds of either rock or sand in it. And you can clip this to your tripod, clip it on, you know, anything you have going there. I think like a 10 pack is like 150, 200 bucks. So it's something that can easily fit in your equipment, but it helps add weight. And so whether or not you're trying to stabilize your camera or frankly, just keeping gear from blowing away. We've had, you know, flags get blown off. We've had, you know, cases that were open get blown over and stuff starts blowing all over. I've actually lost my lens caps being whipped off the camera uh, by the wind itself. So having stuff to weight that down is super critical to get, uh, get and keep your uh, shot and your equipment. The other thing is you wanna protect your camera. So this could again go in cold or warm environments, but also here in windy, is you want to go ahead and have something that protects your camera. So I've used everything from garbage bags. I've used like, you know, Target or bags from a store. You can buy these little camera wrap bags, um, you know, kind of anything you can to get around the camera to kind of keep it. Again, if you're getting that, uh, the sand or whatever that's getting sandblasted, protecting that from getting in your camera, not having it kind of sandblast the side of your camera, any of that's good. So just something cheap and easy around the camera and or your other equipment is something that's super great. So one of the things that you never know is when you wrap these in, you know, in this case, we were shooting inside of a factory and they wanted us to place our small DSLR cameras in kind of this environment where they're getting wet. So we wrapped the camera, we didn't have full, um, 
water housing, but we put them in there, we wrapped them, and we were able to get these great shots. But one of the things is we're gonna talk to you about when you choose a camera. Just because you have big cameras that give you these great things, sometimes where we're asked to put them isn't conducive to a big versus you know small camera. So if you take a look in this one, we set it in, we weren't able to do a test, and as you can see here, when it goes ahead and uh, slides scored us, it got a real tight. We thought that we might have lost a camera. In this case, we were just safe by that much, uh, but you don't want to push it. But having this protection and having the right camera at the right time is a critical thing to know. The other thing I want you to think about is a lot of people think about how to keep their camera safe, lens safe, all that, but then they forget about audio, especially as we're moving to more and more jobs where they send us out in these remote locations and it's just us taking care of everything, is you want to make sure to have a blimp and or a dead cat because when you get these extreme winds, that will absolutely pollute your audio. There is no way to fix it in post. In this case, we were shooting in uh, Chernobyl and we were on top of these, you know, huge buildings and basically we had this nice dead cat out there and it was crazy you know in our ears it was just blowing and crazy and crackling and you were listening on the uh the headphones and it was just you know you could hear a pin drop so you want to have the right protection for your audio and that will definitely help save your shot not only because you need good video but a lot of times we need good audio with it so let's move over to you know things like water and in our case mosquitoes and other pests you know a lot of people when they think of water they think you know beach lake stuff like that which is all good and great, but you can kind of somewhat keep your distance from those. Um, in my case, it's the sort of thing where we weren't shooting always in the rain, but we were actually willingly putting ourselves into scenarios where water was definitely going to get on us, on our gear, on everything, and how are we gonna deal with that? So this might look like an innocuous house, but this turned into basically our form of a uh, nightmare. We basically took water from a lake, pumped it directly into the house, and we were able to take, in the basement held about 40, 40 some thousand gallons of water, and basically we flooded it out. So we were working in this for about two and a half weeks, and it was pretty crazy. So before we go into some of all of those details, we had to not only control where the water's coming in, we had to control what lights were getting in, and then we had to deal with the electricity of those lights, and basically what we were gonna put in the water, what we were not gonna put in the water, and there's a lot of things that went into it, so again, I'm gonna kind of foremost, you know, go with this. But take a look at this little video of me kind of talking midway through, and it's probably about chest high, and just take a look at what it's like. Alrighty, so I'm in the basement, and we're walking around here, taking a look. You can see everything behind me that uh, we're getting ready to shoot our final sequences here. Actually, I'll walk backwards so you can kind of see. Um, but we got all the uh, props floating around. It's kind of up to my chest. Actually, you can see that our actual workbenches have taken float. But it's uh, pretty crazy what we got going on down here. And so, uh, at the end of the day, all the air that I'm breathing here will be gone, and uh, we'll be looking up at the up at these boards and uh, finishing out the movie. So, last of the two days, and then we're all done. So, we're excited to share this with you, and we hope that you enjoy. So, what I wanted to say is what you're going to noticing a pattern. Whether I'm shooting in cold, whether I'm shooting in hot, whether I'm shooting in any of these different locations, a lot of the same issues come up. So, in this case it was high humidity. So we were dealing with not only moisture in the air, we were dealing with water that we were putting into our environment. We were also dealing in an old house that they were demolishing, in which case you can see here, there's a lot of dust and elements there in the actual um, facility. The other thing is we were actually recycling part of the house and actually building part of our set. So now we're doing kind of this crazy abandoned, you know, dirty, messy, crazy stuff to kind of be able to create the environment we wanted. But this meant that we had all this other gunk that was gonna turn into mud and, you know, kind of, pollute everything that we had going on. And so we were kind of almost taking all this and going on. So when we talk about things like wrapping our camera, we actually wrapped our actual set to keep the elements from coming to where we were sitting and storing gear to where we were shooting. So not only were we doing it with our equipment itself, but we were doing it with the whole environment, which is kind of crazy, but it made sense. So the other thing that we didn't really know at the beginning is we were dealing with this live environment and we actually got infested by mosquitoes. They actually started by the end of the job, actually, you know, breeding in our water. And when our crew members would come up from working there all day, this is Georgie, he's a, actually a, uh, a US Marine that was there helping us. And he came up and we looked at him, we're like, you know, thought he was dying of some disease. And it was literally just being down in the water for a couple hours. So these are the stream environments that we're talking about. And this is a great example because it kind of encompasses everything that we're talking about today. So one of the things we talked about earlier is the silica gel. This was mission critical. We had it in all of our cases. We had it next to all the gear because at any time, you know, someone's got wet hands or dropping it, having something that can take any of that moisture away from the gear and keep the gear dry was great. And this was a super cheap and easy way just to have kind of as an insurance policy. The other thing is you want to have towels 
especially absorbent towels. I know that you can go ahead and buy the microfiber. I think it's like a pack of 50 for like 20 bucks you can buy on Amazon. You know, having actual, you know, paper towels, uh, microfiber towels, you know, cotton towels to dry yourself off, your hands off, your equipment off, the surfaces you're working off, it's one of those things that you can never have enough because once those become, you know, basically saturated by water, you need to have new ones. So you have to have a lot of those available to you or know where to pick them up quick and easy. The other thing is you want the right camera. So in this particular case, the film we were shooting, I had an F55 we could have been shooting with, but in the tight spaces we were working at with putting ourselves in these extreme locations where we were flooding, getting the right water housing, we made decisions not just on the best camera, the actual best image coming out, but what was the best to work with? So in this case, we actually worked with an A7S with an underwater housing, which for many reasons, you know, was the right choice for this particular job. So what's great is it was small. We were able to rent a fairly inexpensive water housing and we were able to get these crazy shots and be able to move and be able to create things. So it was very easy for us to keep the actual camera you know, dry by the small housing, but that was just one piece of the puzzle. We had the whole, everything else to work with. So we had our underwater rig set, but then what do we do about battery power versus electricity? We're literally filling a house of 40,000 gallons of water. And as such, we are basically going ahead and putting us at risk of electrocution. So we actually disconnected the, um, uh, electric from the house and we actually ran almost everything off battery, battery power. We actually, at the very beginning, we actually had to go ahead and have some electricity there. And what we actually did is we actually set up a GFI rig just outside and we just told everybody inside the house, don't touch this. But what was crazy is the GFI um, uh, outlet that we were running off of actually became infested by ants. So we actually had to go out there and clear out the ants so that it would stop tripping our uh, GFI plug. And then once we got to a certain point with the water, we actually went ahead and used just battery power. So if you're working around water, you want to realize, keep yourself safe with electricity. In our case, I'd say about 80% was done with battery power. And we just forego having, having electricity of any kind to potentially risk any of our crew members. The other thing is you definitely want to, when you can, rent a water housing. Uh, what my, one of my favorite companies is, is Lens Pro to Go out of the Northeast. They're fantastic. Um, in this case, uh, when we were actually shooting our pickup shots, we were actually shot in a lake. We didn't have that one, so we actually rent from another company. I won't name their name. But it was one of those things that we actually got it and we started having problems with it. Even though we were testing in advance, we only had a short window to shoot. And as you see from this clip, um, it's one of those things where uh, well, let's just say water can get in everything. The other thing is you need to get warm. So we were working when it was about 90 degrees, so it was really hot, we were worried about overheating. But once we went in a concrete basement, it was much colder. And even though we had water coming from a lake that was warm enough to swim in, when you stand in it all day, it just gets too cold. So we had people in wetsuits, we had you know heaters going, we had ways to dry us off. You gotta make sure that if you're working in water to keep yourself warm because it's very easy to kind of lower your core body temperature. And once that happens, it's really, really hard to get back up to uh, our reasonable temperature. So let me go ahead and show you the actual clip from this movie. I want you to take a look at some of our hard work and kind of see what going through all this can kind of yield. So I just want to thank you guys for sitting here. Again, keep asking questions. I'll stay on for a little bit. But again, my name is Barry Anderson. I want to thank Pro Video Coalition for having me back this year. I hope you got some great tips out of this. Um, if you have other ones, ask me questions. Next week, we're going to be talking about great ways to capture good audio in the field. And again, a lot of the useful tips for the situations that a lot of us feel like. So again, Barry Anderson, 
Thank you very much. If you want to reach me, it's Barry Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-S-O-N.com or follow me on Instagram at Barry Anderson. And uh, he goes, get out there, start shooting. And I'd love it if you want to show it show me or share with me any of the videos and or behind the scenes that you guys are shooting in extreme locations and if any of these tips were helpful for you. Thank you very much.